name is James Dean. I'm the head of policy at BBC Media Action. That's the charity set up by the BBC to support media around the world and to advance international development. I'm also currently working two days a week at the moment as a consultant to Luminate. That's a private philanthropic foundation focused on supporting, uh, in terms of my work, uh, developing an international fund for public interest media. Um, I've been asked to talk on the theme of empathy as set out by Paolo Tre, and I've been asked to speak about how Pereira's work applies now and is relevant to the work of a media and communication practitioner. So let me start with what being a practitioner means and where I come from in this debate. I have for almost four decades now worked with organizations that seek to support action capable of improving communication between people. That work has mostly involved supporting processes that ensure that people have access to information that is relevant to them, that they can trust and that they can equip them to take the decisions that affect their lives. And it has involved supporting processes that can enable debate and dialogue among people and especially between people who may disagree with each other. Public debate and dialogue, and I define that here by the character of the information shared in that debate, the representation of the voices heard in that debate, and the character of a debate to enable mutual understanding and effective action. That has been a particular focus of that work. And I consider myself a practitioner in that I've always sought to apply thinking and theory to practice, to support action, to address problems, to enable change. And I came to Pereira as a practitioner. I never really studied him at university and only peripherally when I did a master's in international communication and development. I did read him when I was a student, but I did so as someone interested in international development and in a the belief then, that's the early 1980s, but development was not something that was done to people, but was a process that was driven by them. But he was not on the curriculum. I came to him, I came to understand him more in the context of my practice. In 1984, I joined an organization called Erskan. It was part of one of a few think tanks in the world focused on a growing environmental threat, and that was called the International Institute for Environment and Development, which was founded 10 years earlier by one of the earliest environmentalists, Barbara Ward. Erskan believed that issues of environment and development were inextricably entwined and could only be acted on if people most affected by them had access to information on them. My first job was marketing a slim book called Carbon Dioxide, Climate and Mankind. Along with other Earthscan staff, I later in 1986 helped found another organization called Panos. Panos, it was named after a Nepali word for lamp, which is lit in preparation for a discussion of importance, took the focus on making information available on key issues and worked to generate real public debate around them. It focused increasingly on working to assure the voices in that debate were from the countries most affected by those issues. And one of the earliest issues Panos focused on was HIV AIDS. Panos was arguably the first organization in the world to highlight the severity of the HIV crisis for what was then referred to as the third world. But we also became increasingly alarmed at the international response and especially the communication response to it. Our analysis of the pandemic was that its spread was inextricably linked to issues of gender inequality, of poverty, of prejudice, and of political marginalization. One of the first reports we published, written by Renee Sabati, was called Blaming Others, Prejudice and Worldwide AIDS. Another series of reports by Judy Mursky focused on the triple jeopardy women confronted, being more physically vulnerable to the virus, more likely to take on the burden as carers, and above all, having insufficient power to negotiate the terms on which they had sex. Communication programs tended to ignore these social, economic and political concerns and treat the issue as principally one of changing people's behaviours. Some social marketing campaigns and programmes even exacerbated the problem by developing, for example, condom brands that carried messages designed to appeal to men's machismo like Panther and Tiger. And that's how I returned to prayer. 
his understanding of communication as something that needs to be from people and between people, most affected by an issue, and not as a message to be imparted to people, became urgently relevant. And in terms of empathy, that those who are most affected by an issue, like HIV, are those in the best position often to understand it and guide action around it. Prayer was not an abstract intellectual reference point, but a guide to what actually worked. Top-down communication messaging did not work. When I started working on HIV in 1985, there were around 4 million estimated to be infected with the epidemic in the world. Um, and most of those were understood to mostly be um, in North America um, uh, and Europe. I largely stopped working on it in 2001, by which time more than 30 million were infected. That is a huge failure. And given the absence of any medical or scientific intervention being available to stem the spread, it was substantially a failure of communication. And most of that failure was one which did not see that the fundamental principle that needed to guide action was that those most affected need to be not only listened to, but to be substantially agents of the response. Once treatments became available, that is exactly what happened. People with HIV formed themselves into highly organized advocacy networks that both demanded, but also shaped the response. That is when the response became more effective. But I'm more convinced uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that far more could have been done in communication terms if the international response had spent more time listening, demonstrating empathy in the Pererian sense and less time instructing people what to do. Pererian think, thinking of a role of communication as dialogue with the aim of empowering those most affected by an issue helped inform much of the thinking of Panos as an organisation not only on HIV, but on many other issues, such as on genetically modified organisms. I later became director of PANOS, and these principles shaped our decision to restructure the organization to no longer be headquartered in London, Paris, and Washington, but to become a decentralized network of institutions run by largely autonomous institutions in Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, South Asia, and the Caribbean. Later, I joined the Communication for Social Change Consortium, which sought to try to influence international development policy in reshaping how development actors conceptualized, prioritized, and supported development programming. The consortium, under the leadership of Denise Gray Felder and with Alfonso Camuccio, brought together in the late 1990s and early 2000s a group of practitioners, academics, and policymakers, mostly from the global south, and heavily influenced by agrarian thinking to find communication for social change as a process of public and private dialogue through which people define who they are, what they want and how they can get it. We also identified key components or principles of any effective model of communication for social change, um, communication for social change, including, and I'll list a few, sustainability of social change is more likely if the individuals and communities most affected own the process and content of communication. Communication with social change should be empowering, horizontal versus top-down, give a voice to the previously unheard members of a community and be based towards local content and ownership. Communities should be agents of their own change. Emphasis should shift from persuasion and a transmission of information from outside technical experts to dialogue, debate, and information on issues that resonate with members of a community. Emphasis on outcomes should go beyond individual behavior to social norms, policies, culture, and a supporting environment. Much has changed since then, and most obviously the growth and then dominance of the social media platforms in shaping the terms of debate and dialogue everywhere and determining the character of our 21st century information and communication environments. I won't try here to summarize the huge tensions that have arisen, other than to say that in the early years of these platforms, there was immense excitement about the potential to translate these principles into reality at huge scale by providing unprecedented fresh access to amplify previously marginalized voices, provide new opportunities to connect and organize to advance their interests. We have, of course, seen some of that come to fruition, 
But so too, of course, has been toxic polarization, disinformation, misinformation, <clears throat> and what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. Now I work for BBC Media Action, the international media support charity of the BBC. That may seem an odd place to try to apply agrarian principles, and in some ways it is. But I remain passionate about participatory communication, but also understand its limits, and in particular, some of the constraints about working at scale. BBC Media Action largely focuses on enabling debate and dialogue across society. It used to be a largely London-based organization, but it has offices now in more than 20 countries, with a vast majority of its staff drawn from those countries. It reaches more than 100 million people worldwide, and part of my job has been to have overall management responsibility for its team of more than 50 researchers who spend their time largely in the field working to understand the issues that people most want to talk about, the information sources they most relate to, um, uh, related to and trust, and to provide platforms to debate most affected by development issues to have their say on those issues. Its role is supporting community media in settings as diverse as Nepal and Zambia into major online broadcast independent media outlets like Al Mirbad in Iraq, to enabling national debate uh, programs in Afghanistan to support to supporting dramas in Myanmar, Nigeria, and Bangladesh. And at the heart of all this work are the voices of people, enabling people to be heard, to engage in debate and dialogue with each other, but to work at scale in doing so. Which leads me to my final reflection. Pereira used the term empathy principally in relation to the oppressed. And this was mainly in the context of a colonized. The purpose of dialogue in his thinking was not simply discussion, but liberation of a mind and of politics. Now I'm a white British middle-class man working for an organization linked to the British Broadcasting Corporation, poorly qualified to provide commentary on how prayer's thinking applies now. But I do want to say just one thing in this respect. Former president of Ghana, John Kafour, has powerfully argued that African nations and other former developing countries stand on the cusp of economic and political renewal. He argues that young, dynamic, entrepreneurial Africans have the opportunity to advance fresh, confident narratives rooted in their own traditions and aspirations. What most threatens this, he argues, is the lack of a functioning information and communication system capable of enabling Africa to know itself, as he says, referring to how few Ghanaians have ways of knowing what happens next door in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, and the diminishing opportunities for media to enable societies to tell their own stories and advance their own narratives. He is backing two initiatives, both of which I'm involved in, one an African public interest media initiative and the second, an international fund for public interest media. And these are designed to address a really concerning reality. The business model for independent journalism is broken and it is most broken in countries with weak advertising markets and where political investments intent on controlling the media are strongest. And entertainment media are increasingly disappearing behind subscription paywalls. Public interest media are in precipitate decline overall. And the principal platforms for dialogue and debate are the social media platforms over which people of these societies have almost no influence. The net result is that dialogue in society is not characterized by empathy. It is characterized by toxic polarization, by misinformation and disinformation, and increasingly the fear that we are witnessing a hollowing out of a public sphere of many countries. Prairie and dialogue cannot, I don't think, flourish in such conditions. And it particularly cannot flourish in the most challenging market failure of all. Media that is rooted in the lived reality of people's lives and above all that which is capable of enabling people who are different from one another to encounter and enter to, in, into dialogue with each other is a media that is arguably least capable of finding a business model to support it. The media that is likely to flourish is that which can target specific populations and some of the most effective strategies so often encouraged by political forces is to de demonize the other in society. The tragic reality is that there isn't a business model available to support public dialogue in 21st century societies characterized by empathy. There remains immense work to do 
to bring those principles to life.